This video is for those of you who have just started out taking drum lessons or maybe you've been taking lessons for a little while now because there might still be a couple things that your teacher has not mentioned to you. Now I'm not saying this as a criticism to drum teachers but all of these are important points that I myself have been guilty of failing to mention to my students. I would say the reason for that is that lesson time is really short. Your teacher has so much that they want to tell you about the drums and about playing and also a lot of newer drum students might not have access to acoustic drums of their own. So as teachers, we really want to maximize your playing time and make sure you get to enjoy playing music. And there's just so much about the instrument to try and cram into that little span of time that sometimes we just miss out mentioning a couple things. Here are a few small but important things about the drum set that you might or might not be aware of. The first piece of equipment that you're going to come into contact with in your drum lesson is the drum throne, which you sit on. And sometimes we don't pay much attention to that because we're too busy being distracted by all the other shiny things. But it is really important to know how to adjust the height of your drum throne because we are all generally of different heights and our legs are of different lengths. So you're going to need to adjust this in order to have a more ergonomic posture on the kit and be able to play your bass drum comfortably. At the moment, although it looks like my leg is pretty much parallel to the ground, that's not necessarily a good position if I want to be playing my bass drum because the moment I lift my leg to execute a stroke, it's now going above 90 degrees from the ground, so it's coming up a little bit this way. This is definitely way too low for me, so I would need to raise it. A good rule of thumb for the height of your drum throne will be to move it to a height that is just a little bit above your knee which for me is usually somewhere around here. This is so much more comfortable and I will be able to play easily without using as much effort. Different thrones are adjusted differently, so just figure out how the one you have works and remember to set it to a comfortable height before you start playing. After sitting on the drum throne, the next part of the drum set a new drummer is most likely to start playing is the snare drum but you might not be sure why it's called a snare drum. So let me show you. This is the bottom of a snare drum and you can see that there are these curly wires attached to it. These are called the snare wires. They can be replaced. So you have different snare wires that are made of different materials or you can have a different number of strands for a different sound. But what you need to know is that those are the reasons why a snare drum is called a snare drum and they basically just vibrate against the resonant head which you can hear them vibrating while i'm talking they vibrate against the resonant head to give it that distinctive kind of buzzing high-pitched sound or quality that a snare drum has that a tom doesn't now the important thing that you want to know about a snare drum or about the snare wires is that there's this thing called a throw off this one operates by just coming down this way, but there are other throw-offs on different drums that will rotate to the side or it's kind of like a little lever that you pull. And what this does is it will either tighten or loosen your snare wires. So currently the throw-off is engaged. And so when I hit the drum, you can hear the wires resonating. But if I turn the snares off, you might not be able to see, but the wires are now hanging loose and they don't actually touch the head directly. I'm going to get this kind of a hollow sound instead. So that's snares off. If your snare is making this kind of sound, then, well, and you didn't want it to, it's probably because you accidentally turned the snares off and you just need to engage that back. This little dial over here is how you can adjust how tight the wires are against the bottom head. So again, if your snare sounds like it's on, but the wires are just rattling too much, maybe you just need to tighten this a bit, just rotate it clockwise, and that will tighten up your snare wires. Good stuff to know. The next most frequently used part of the drums is probably your hi-hat. And generally, you're just going to have your foot on the pedal, and close it and play that closed for the first part of your drum set learning. But what if you come to the drum set and this happens? And you're stepping down on it and nothing moves, it doesn't open at all. That's because this entire section here, this is called the hi-hat clutch, can be adjusted and you can actually just remove the entire top hat this way. This can be screwed off these two segments of the hi-hat clutch kind of just join together to grab the top segment of your hi-hat, or the top symbol rather. 
And you can actually just adjust this by loosening the clutch slightly, stepping down to where you want it, and tightening that back. So if your foot is not controlled enough to make fine adjustments, you can also just grab it by the clutch, hold that, and adjust it to wherever you need it to be. So for example, if I wanted it kind of small, I could do this. If I wanted it at a bigger gap. So this seems like a pretty simple thing, but sometimes I see students just grappling at the edge of the hi-hat. You don't need to touch the symbol at all. Just grab this part, anti-clockwise to loosen, shift it, tighten, and you're good to go. Those were all tips about individual parts of the drum set, but what about the kit as a whole? Something I noticed that a couple newer drum set students didn't realize is that the drum set is not really an instrument. It's actually a whole bunch of instruments put together that are sort of gradually becoming an instrument. And that means one drum set could sound very different from another drum set. They're gonna have different configurations. There might be different numbers of toms. Some drum sets have one rack tom, some have two. Some drummers choose not to have any rack toms. They might have one or two floor toms. Some drummers even have multiple snare drums. And definitely the number and type of cymbals they have on their drum kit is going to vary a lot. What this also means is if you are shopping for your very first drum set, don't expect it to come with all the cymbals and snare and pedals and everything all together. It is very normal for drums to be sold as a shell pack, and that means it's just going to have maybe your toms and your kick. The snare could be optional. Shells refer to the actual drums, which are made of wooden shells over here. They have the rims and the heads on them. And Usually, they won't come with cymbals, they won't come with hardware. Hardware refers to all your cymbal stands, your pedals, things like the drum throne. All these things are just a matter of personal preference, so a lot of times drummers will buy them separately and kind of mix and match to create their unique sound and identity. I would say the best analogy for this is kind of like how we choose clothes to wear. Just because I like a pair of pants doesn't mean that I expect it to come with the shirt and socks and shoes that all go together. I wouldn't be happy if that were the case because we're so used to mixing and matching different pieces of clothing to create our own individual style. And it's pretty much the same for drums. This one is important, so I'm gonna get in here and just tell you straight up. Drums need to be tuned and you are the one who needs to learn how to tune your drums. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a moment. In order to tune a drum, you're going to need a drum key, which is one of these little gizmos with a square shaped hole in the bottom. Here's one of my toms for an example. Every drum is made up of the shell, the rim, as well as the drum head, which is the surface you're hitting. And those three things are held together by this over here, which is a lug. So these are little screws that you can tighten with a drum key or loosen, depending on the case. And you need to make sure all of these are evenly tensioned in order for the head to be in tune with itself. There are two heads on most drum set drums. The top head, which you hit, is called the batter head, and the bottom one is called the resonant head. So the resonant head basically resonates to give you the tone of the drum. It affects the pitch probably more than the batter head, whereas the batter head uh, affects more of the feel of the drum, but both of them in combination will create the overall pitch of the drum. I'm not gonna go into detail about how to tune a drum right now, but there are so many resources on how to tune drums, just go learn how to tune a drum. I've seen way too many drummers who can play, who have played for years, but they just refuse to tune a kit even though it sounds bad. And by extension, they sound bad, although they really shouldn't. And sometimes they'll just say, oh, I don't know how to tune drums. All the information is out there. Go look it up and then find a drum to practice on. It's not an excuse to say that you don't have acoustic drums. As long as you know someone who does, you can always volunteer to help them tune their drums or experiment on it. How I used to practice tuning drums was I would just volunteer to do head changes, whether it was at my school societies or for smaller churches where they had abandoned drums that sounded really bad. So my logic was I probably can't make it worse, so I'm just going to try and experiment and see if I can make it sound better. So tuning the drums, also a skill to learn, also something that gets better with practice. So learn it, please. 
We haven't actually talked about symbols yet in this video, and I'm pretty sure you guys know about your hi-hats as well as crash symbols and ride symbols, but there are actually more than that. There's other kinds of symbols. For example, you have these little guys called splash symbols that make a kind of cuter kind of sound. You have a whole range of things that fall in the category of effect symbols. This one, for example, has holes in it, which creates a trashier kind of sound. And you also have other kinds of symbols that maybe have this sort of curved profile. This is a China symbol, and this is also a flat symbol, which means it doesn't have a bell. The usual China that I have on my kit over here does have a bell. And there's also things like stacks where you can put two symbols on top of each other to create a shorter tail kind of sound. So there's a lot to know about the world of symbols. That said, what a lot of students don't realize is that the terms crash and ride were actually verbs and not nouns. That means they're action words. A crash is a way to strike a symbol which produces a louder accented sound, usually with more wash. And riding a symbol is when you use the symbol for timekeeping purposes. Originally, there were no distinctions between crashes and rides, there were just symbols. But as drumming and the drum industry, or rather the symbol industry progressed, they started categorizing symbols differently based on what they did better. So this motion over here is actually crashing a symbol, while this motion is more of riding a symbol. And that means you can actually ride on a crash symbol and you could crash on a ride symbol. There's a whole other category of symbols that are somewhere in between called crash rides. That's actually a thing. But in general, crashes are a little bit smaller and thinner and ride symbols tend to be heavier or thicker as well as a little bit larger. But there's definitely no clear distinction between the two of them. And a lot of times when you hear songs, you might be confused as to what kind of symbol you're hearing. Honestly, it doesn't matter. What you want to imitate is the sound of that symbol. So maybe they were actually crashing a very washy sounding ride to get a certain kind of sound. But if your ride symbol is very pingy and it gives you a lot of high pitched attack, then you might want to replace that sound with your crash symbol. That leads us to my final point, and that is how drums will sound very different based on whether you're hearing them in person or you're listening to them on a record, and different recorded drums are going to sound different. This kind of ties into the earlier point where I was talking about how different drum sets are all made up of different components, they might be tuned differently, there's different symbols used. Besides that, drums that are recorded are recorded through microphones. And different microphones are going to have different characteristics that they pick up of the recorded sound. Now you might say, I'm just starting out. I don't need to record anything. Why do I need to know this? What I realized is that some of my drum students were very puzzled when listening to songs because they couldn't recognize the drum sound in the track when they compared it to what they were hearing in person in the room. So just be aware that all these factors of the different drum sets, the different microphones, and once the drums have been recorded, the different mixing techniques that audio engineers use to blend the drum sound in with the rest of the music, they're all going to combine to create a different sound. So it is a process to learn to recognize what part of the drum is actually being played and then subsequently to interpret that into your own drum part that you can play on your drum set. Sort of related to this is the fact that drums sound different based on the space they're in. So when you go to your drum teacher's music studio, chances are they might have treated the walls with some kind of acoustic treatment like I have in my studio here. This is not soundproofing, by the way, because it doesn't actually prevent sound from leaving the space. But what it does is it makes the drums sound better within the room by breaking up the reflections of the sound. If you took the exact same drums that you play in the music studio back to your home and you tried playing them in a room with bare walls, they're going to sound so different because the sound is just going to reflect everywhere and it'll sound pretty bad, honestly, besides also destroying your ears. On that note, whether or not your walls are treated, please remember to use hearing protection whenever you practice acoustic drums at length. They are loud and they will cause damage to your hearing over time. So don't forget that. That was a bit of a side point, but an important one. So just want you guys to take note of the fact that the sound of your drum is going to change depending on the environment it's in. This is also why you might hear the phrase 
play to the room crop up when you're talking to drummers and musicians, that just means that you need to adjust your playing style depending on the environment that your drum set is in. So if you're playing to a very small cramped bar, you're going to play a lot differently than if you were in a large stadium or a concert hall, an auditorium. It's all going to affect the amount of energy that you want to put into the instrument so that your audience still hears it at an appropriate level. That brings us to the end of this video. This is a bit strange, but I actually hope you didn't learn anything new because that means you knew everything that was mentioned in this video. But if you didn't, that's awesome. Now you know. Feel free to share this with any of your friends who you know are starting out on their drumming journey. Or if you're a drum teacher, feel free to share it with your new students as well. And if there's anything else that you think a beginner drummer would need to know about the drum set that they might not figure out so easily on their own, please feel free to mention it in the comments below. And yeah, I think that's about it. Take care, keep drumming, and I will see you guys the next time. Bye. Yeah. You know what? I don't care. I'm just gonna ramble.